Hey, what's up? Welcome to Free Advice Friday. It's been a little while since I was able to do one of these. The schedule has been pretty crazy for the last few weeks. Obviously, uh, last week, being able to be at VO Atlanta was fantastic. First time that I've been at VO Atlanta since 2019. Uh, so it was really awesome to finally be able to go back there. I was traveling for March break with my family. So, hey, I know it's been a crazy schedule, but we're back. We're live. We're we're ready to do free advice Friday, and I am here to answer any business and marketing questions that you may have once again. I'm working on the free advice Friday schedule. Um, looking forward to bringing some guests back onto free advice Friday again. So that is definitely in the works. That is going to happen. Uh, the first one, Cliff Zellman, has already agreed to do free advice Friday. So make sure that you make note of this one. Write that date down. Put it on your calendar. Cliff is going to join me live here on YouTube that's going to happen on April the 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern. So if you've got questions that you want to get answered about all things automotive voiceover, uh, this is the one that you're going to want to be to. So that one is coming up on April the 21st. Uh, I've also talked to several other people who have agreed to do Free Advice Friday, uh, just waiting for the opportunity to get them into the calendar and then as soon as I have them in the calendar, I will uh, post those dates and let you know. But uh, there are some things in the works anyway. But in the meantime, I'm here. We're hanging out. I'm excited to be here. Uh, it was great to see so many people at VO Atlanta. If you were at VO Atlanta, I would love to hear about your experience. Feel free to type something in the comments. Let me know what you thought of, of VO Atlanta. It was so good to be back. It was crazy. There were so many people there. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've heard people saying that there was like a thousand voice actors there, which is absolutely bonkers. Uh, but it was it was awesome. Anyway, it was awesome to be back. I was I was grateful to have the opportunity to speak at VO Atlanta again. And uh, it was also great to run into Hugh Edwards at VO Atlanta and have him let me know that uh, I was coming to One Voice. So I am excited to be able to do One Voice in Dallas coming up in August, which is going to be fantastic as well. So tell me what I can do for you today on Free Advice Friday. If you have got a business and marketing related question, I am here to answer all of your business and marketing related questions. So don't be shy. If you've got a question that you would like to ask, you can feel free to type that into the comments. If you just put a Q uh, at the start of your, uh, your comment there, that way it will pop out in the screen and it makes it easier for me to, to spot. And I am happy to answer uh, any of your voiceover business and marketing related questions that you may have. So feel free to ask away. In the meantime, welcome Heather, Cam, and great to see you, Ryan, Derek. Juan is hanging out today. Great to see you guys uh, again. Feels good to be back on Free Advice Friday after, after missing these for a while. So don't be shy. Tell me what I can do. How can I help you? What questions can I answer for you? Uh, let, let's get into it here for Free Advice Friday. I will say... One of the things that uh, I, I learned over the course of the weekend at VO Atlanta, and I, I made a post about this in the VOpreneur group yesterday, but it's worth reiterating here just in case you missed that post. Uh, in one of the sessions that I, I did have the opportunity to go to, and, and I didn't get to do as many sessions as I would have liked, but in one of the sessions with one of the most respected and reputable casting directors that there exists in, in our industry, um, Talking about receiving all of the auditions and, and the fact that they listen to every one of the auditions and, and on a casting, it is not uncommon for them to get like 800 auditions, apparently. Uh, it is also, if they get 800 auditions, they will legitimately answer or listen to rather 800 auditions. But what we learned was maybe 500 of those auditions will be cast aside most commonly because of bad audio. And what I thought was really interesting was that I don't even know, there was probably a couple hundred voice actors in the room at that point. It was standing room only people were sitting on the floor. And if you asked every single one of the voice actors in that room, whether or not they had professional broadcast quality audio, I would be willing to bet that every single one of the voice actors in that room would have said that they had professional broadcast quality audio. But obviously, that is not the case if 500 out of 800 auditions are getting eliminated because of poor audio. 
So if you are not 100% confident in your audio, if you have never had anybody else listen to your sound before, a professional, if you've never had a professional listen to your sound before, now's the time to do it. Because can you imagine if you've been auditioning this whole entire time and the reason why you're book, not booking has nothing to do with the, with your auditions themselves. It, it has to do with your audio is not where it needs to be. The quality of your sound is not what it needs to be. That would be a bummer. And that is something that can easily be fixed. I mean, when I had my studio put together, I went through the World Voices uh, studio approval process, the Wovo studio approval process. And I didn't go through that process because I thought that it was going to make a difference with any of my buyers because none of my voice buyers have any idea what the Wovo studio approval process is. But I went through that process so that I could be 100% confident in knowing that my sound quality was on point. I went through that process so that I wouldn't have to wonder because people who are smarter and more qualified than me listen to my audio and those people told me that my audio was good. That is why I went through that process. So if you've never done something like that, I strongly advise you to do it because it could be one of the reasons why you are not booking. So that was one of the most profound things that I learned at, at VO Atlanta. And that was actually right in alignment with when I was doing the online casting series on the podcast and interviewing CEOs from all of the different online casting sites, all of them said the same thing. Bad audio quality was the number one complaint that they got from voice buyers. So check your sound, check your sound and make sure that it's good. All right, let's do some questions here for free advice Friday. This one comes from Derek. I see a phone number in a lot of your material. Do you use a web number, a second number through your cell provider, et cetera? I would love to be able to use, uh, I think it's Google Voice, but it's not available here. Uh, so that is my number. That is that is my number. Um, I put it out there. Uh, I can't tell you how many times President Biden has forgiven my student loans, which has been fantastic. It would be even better if I was American, and it would be even better still if I had student loans. But uh, the, the downside to putting your number out there is that I get... 50 million spam calls a day, uh, which is incredibly frustrating. But every once in a while, somebody does call me for a voiceover, and so it makes it worthwhile. But if I had the option, I would absolutely use uh, a Google number, which I know it can give you a number that can then you know forward to your, to your cell phone or whatever. Uh, unfortunately, that does not exist here. If it did, though, you better believe I would be taking advantage of it. Julie says, how important is a color for your web page? I know there are different marketing colors, i.e. yellow for McDonald's. Does it matter? I'm in the process of setting up my page, and I might be overthinking this. Julie, this is a really great question. So Wednesday night, I read Celia Siegel's book, Voice Over Achiever. If you've never read that book, you should absolutely read that book. I, I highly recommend that book to, to every single person. I had never read it before. I read it Wednesday night. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, and it, it walks you through branding and all of the things that you need to understand about setting up your brand, which is incredibly helpful and, and fantastic. And Celia does it in a way that is great because Celia is great. And in it, she does talk about color. And I do think that picking a color does matter. I do think that the colors that we choose, there, there are, um, there's theory behind color and different colors mean different things. And so that is absolutely something that should be taken into consideration. I also think that once you settle on your color, the other big thing is that you are consistent across the board with your colors. And so make sure once you've decided what your color is going to be, that that is the color that you're using on your website. That is the color that you're using on your social media banners. That is the color that you are using in your marketing collateral. That is the color that you're using on your business card. I think the same thing goes for when you choose a font, you use that font consistently across the board. And so I don't, I don't think that you're necessarily overthinking it unless you are putting yourself in, in a state of paralysis where you're thinking about it so hard that you're not actually doing anything with it. But definitely, I think that some thought should be put into the colors that you choose and, and how those colors are going to represent you and how those colors are going to reflect. 
and then making sure that you are just consistently using those same colors across the board. And I did put a link in the chat if any of you would like to check that out. The, the, it's a link to Celia Siegel's book. It's called Boy Silver Achiever. And uh, again, can't recommend it enough. Don't know why I waited so long to read it, but it was absolutely a brilliant book. All right, here's one from Anne. I know you probably answered this a million times, but what do you say in a follow-up email to those who you have not heard back from off your initial contact? Okay, uh, last week I reached out to you regarding such and such work. Have you had an opportunity to listen to my demo? Um, can I answer any questions for you about my service? Uh, can we set up a time to, to have a chat? How about next Tuesday at 3 uh, it's literally just a one or two sentence email that's basically just bumping your email back to the top. I think we've all been in that situation in the past where an email has come in and when that email has landed in our inbox, we had every intention of, of answering that email. We had every intention of responding to the individual who sent that email, but because of life, things were going on, whatever, maybe we didn't get there. Maybe we didn't get a chance to answer that email and, and then we forget about it, right? And it's not that we're, we're trying to be rude. It's not that we're trying to ignore people. It's just, oops, I forgot. And so by having that email bumped to the top, you're like, oh yes, I meant to respond to that person and I had totally forgot to respond to that person. And so there you go. Now it's back up at the top and you, and you get to respond. That's the, all you're trying to achieve with this follow-up email. Maybe when your initial email came in, they were at their kid's dance recital. They were in the middle of a meeting. They were watching their favorite show and, and it wasn't a commercial break and so they couldn't stop what they were doing. Uh, whatever, there's a thousand reasons why we, we don't answer an email when an email lands. There's a thousand emails why we forget to answer an email when an email lands. And so, so often that follow-up email is just that one thing that just bumps it up and we're like, oh, I meant to respond, now I'm gonna respond. So don't overthink the follow-up email, short, sweet, to the point. Give them a really clear call to action, something that tells them this is this is what I want you to do next, uh, and that's the strategy that you want to make for the uh, for the follow up email. Uh, Troy says, "Sound the easiest fix we can make through a pro. Many out there who can eval and fix. I'm moving to a room versus a box soon, and will definitely need a checkup. Yeah, and that's that. That's it. I mean, I'm not an engineer." And I know I'm not an engineer and I'm not gonna pretend to be an engineer. I don't, I don't wanna try to be an engineer. There are engineers out there. And so I would so much rather go to, to one of those people and have one of those people deal with that for me so that I don't have to think about it because I don't want to find myself in a situation where I am putting out bad audio. I never ever want to find myself in a situation where I am putting out bad audio. Julie says, every time I see your videos, I think thinking my screen is dirty as I see your two little holes in the wall behind you. Oh my gosh, let me tell you something. If I if I actually move out of the way here, so there's, there's a hole here and there's a hole here and there's a hole here. There's actually a bunch of holes in the wall there. Uh, and then if I move out of the way here, there's a hole there, there's a hole there, there's a hole there. Uh, there used to be a big thing that hung up on the wall behind me, and and the truth is I've just never got around to patching the drywall, and, and I, I, I apologize because I feel you. I look at those things, and I'm like, there's little flies on the screen or something like that. Uh, it, it drives me crazy as well. Um, one of these days, though, one of these days I'll patch it. The problem is I know that if I patch the holes, then I'm going to have to paint, and then that turns into a whole other situation. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't have time to do this, and so... Uh, that's why. So in the meantime, I will let you, Julie, continue to think that your screen is is dirty and, and that's just how, how that works. Again, welcome to Free Advice Friday. Looking forward to spending some time with you guys today. If you've got a question that you would like to get answered, by all means, don't be shy. Feel free to type that question into the comments. I would just ask if you could put a Q uh, beside your question when you pop it into the chat. And that way it stands out a little bit easier for me. Uh, I, I can find it in the chat a little bit easier because there's so much going on uh, in the chat, generally speaking, so I don't want to miss anything if something pops up. Um, Marie says, comment regarding color. I agree that color plays a big part. For instance, American Express, AT&T, LinkedIn, Facebook all use blue, which oozes trust. Yeah, and that's the thing. There are, there are literally charts that, that outline this. Um, there's charts for color meaning, and 
you know, this one eludes trust and this one is, you know, makes makes me feel happy and, and all of that sort of stuff. The color theory uh, is is basically what it what it's uh, what they call it. I can't tell you specifically what all of the, the meanings for all of those things are. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, I know that it is real and uh, that the, the psychology behind it can be real. And so that actually does make a difference. Actually, you know what? Here, let's do this very quickly. Let me just, uh, let me switch over here to, uh, I, I had to Google it so that I could find out. So there you go. There's uh, there's the color theory uh, for those of you that are curious about it. So I, I apologize. I, I have to look over here because it's on a, a separate screen. But uh, so red, excitement, strength, love, and energy. Orange, confidence, success, bravery, and sociability. Orange obviously is a big color for me. Uh, Purple, royalty, obviously I'm the king of marketing, right? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I just said that. Uh, luxury, spirituality, ambition. You know, I, I use a lot of purples and, and blues as well. Uh, yellow, creativity, happiness, warmth, and cheer. Green is nature, healing, freshness, quality, blue, trust, peace, loyalty, competence. Do we really trust Facebook? I'm just asking the question. Uh, pink is for compassion, sincerity, sophistication and sweet brown dependable rugged trustworthy and simple black formality dramatic sophistication security white clean simplicity innocence and, and honesty so there you go there's what some of those colors mean and this is something that you can figure out very very quickly if you if you just do a quick google search and and it'll come up with that uh that information so if you look at it um Picking the right color, it matters though. But here's the other thing. If you pick the wrong color, it's not the end of the world because as far as I know, there's nobody stopping you from changing your color once you've made a decision. So, you know, don't be afraid. Pippa says, what is your advice on finding work to become the voice of TV networks and where to start? So uh, Pippa, there's, there's two different things here. Are we talking promo or are we talking affiliate? So Promo is what Joe Cipriano does. It's it's the voice that comes on and says tonight on Fox or you know this week on The Simpsons or or whatever. And that would be promo, uh, which you see on television. Obviously, in every single commercial break, there are promos for what shows coming up next, what's happening next on the network or whatever. Affiliate uh, is kind of the same idea, but at the local level, uh, that's the voice that says you know tonight at five on KTLA News or whatever. Uh, and so that's that's something that's slightly different. Um, you will need to have a demo that is specific to whichever one you are choosing. If you're choosing to do affiliate, if you're choosing to do promo, you're going to want to have a, a demo that is specific to it. If you are looking to do promo, the reality of promo is that the big promo jobs for the larger networks, those are going to come through agents and they're going to come through top tier agents. And so what you would be looking at then is, you know, reverse engineer the process. Okay, I want to do promo. And if I want to do promo, these are the agents that are doing promo. So, okay, these are the agents that are doing promo. How do I get in with these agents that are doing promo? Okay, I'm going to look for workshops that have the op that give me the opportunity to read for these agents so that I can get on their radar. I also want to make sure that I've got the best commercial demo that I can possibly have because a lot of them are probably hiring for commercial as well. I want to make sure that I've got the best promo demo that I've got. Who do I go to to get the best commercial demo? Who do I go to to get the pr best uh, promo demo, right? And so you're just reverse engineering that whole entire process. Affiliate, slightly different. Affiliate is something that you may be able to go out and get on your own, particularly at the local level. Uh, again, you've got to have the right demo for it. I would say uh, that's a conversation that I would be having with somebody like an AJ McKay, for example, who I know works in the space and, and does uh, does demos in the space as well. Um, in which case, then you're you're looking to establish relationships probably with with program directors and and uh, program managers uh, at some of these stations, but. Again, before you're reaching out and, and making those connections, you want to make sure that you're coached up. You want to make sure that you've got the right demos. You want to make sure that you're ready to put your best foot forward and present yourself in the right way so that you're making that good impression ultimately when you're when you're reaching out and connecting with these people. Cam says, when it comes to CRMs, any recommendations and do most offer free trial periods? Uh, 100%, uh, most of them offer free trial periods. Those trial periods will usually go anywhere from a week to 30 days, depending on the CRM that you are looking at. Um, for me personally, I'm a big fan of Nimble. That is the CRM that I use. That is the CRM that I have been using for, I don't even know at this point, probably about six years 
Uh, if you go to this link here, nimble.com, actually, you know what? That's not the right link. Hold on a second. I Mark Scott VO. There's the right link. It's nimble.com forward slash Mark Scott VO. Uh, if you sign up there for Nimble, you can get a 45 day trial. Um, I just went to Nimble and said, hey, look, your 10 day trial isn't enough. Can you can you give us longer? And so that's that's the deal we set up. Uh, so nimble.com forward slash Mark Scott VO. Um, let's see what else is out there. Zoho is another very popular CRM uh, streak. If you are a Gmail user, uh, streak works very well with Gmail and that's a popular CRM. Um, close, uh, C-L-O-Z-E. There are two different closed CRMs, which is not confusing at all, but it's C-L-O-Z-E. Um, that's another very popular one. HubSpot offers a free CRM, although I will say that the free HubSpot CRM is a pretty basic CRM. And if you decide that you want to upgrade, the challenge with, with HubSpot is that it really is more of an enterprise grade CRM. And so it can get very pricey. Uh, Brad Newman, upper level CRM. A lot of people are familiar with Brad. A lot of people host their websites with Brad. So upper level CRM is certainly another choice that is out there. Um, for most CRMs that I would say are geared towards a, a voice actor, which would be a, a solopreneur, a, a small business owner, I would say that you're probably looking to spend between $20 and $30 a month on average. Now, you're going to find some that might be a little bit more. You're going to find some that might be a little bit less. But somewhere in that range is pretty much what you can expect, uh, which is not unreasonable when you think about it and when you think about what a CRM can ultimately do for your business as well. Uh, but I would encourage you to to play around with a few different CRMs. Try some of them out. See if you can find one that, that you like, one that, that works really well for you. Uh, and then settle in and, and do it. Um, my best advice for CRM, there, there's two things. One, the sooner that you start with the CRM, the better, because the larger that your database is, the harder that it ultimately becomes to get that database set up. So when I started with my CRM, I literally had thousands of contacts in my CRM. And so I had to go through one by one by one and, and update all of those contacts. And it was not a fun, not an enjoyable experience at all. So the sooner you start with the CRM, I think is the better. And the other thing I would say is when you are starting with a CRM, most CRMs will allow you to import a CSV file with all of your contacts. And without getting too technical, a CSV file is just a file that, that you can get that breaks down all of your contacts, allows you to import them all in bulk. I would actually advise against that. And I know this is going to seem counterintuitive because you're going to say this is going to create so much more work. If you're going to set up your CRM properly, you're going to have to go through every single one of your contacts one by one anyway, because you're going to need to add a lot of information to each one of those contacts. You're going to have to add things like addresses and phone numbers and websites and social media profiles and tags and, and all these different things that you're going to want to have in your database. And so rather than importing everybody all at once, I would actually encourage you to just work away at it one at a time. Set a goal for yourself. I'm going to do 20 contacts each day. Import 20 contacts into your CRM. Customize those 20 contacts with all of the necessary information that you want to have in your CRM. And contact those 20 people while you are at it so that you are now bringing your database up to date as you are building your database. And I think that's a much smarter way to do it. Uh, if you want to check out this podcast episode, it was episode 201. So this is from a couple of weeks ago, 10 things to look for in a CRM. Uh, and I literally just walked through 10 of the most popular features that I'm using in Nimble and why I love uh, those features in Nimble. So you can check that episode out. Of course, that's available anywhere. Find podcasts are given away for free. You can do a search for it. 10 things to look for in a CRM, or you can go straight to vopreneur.com and listen to the episode there. Uh, Viopreneur.com forward slash podcast forward slash 201. All right, let's see. Where are we going? Briscoe Vio, what would you say the top three ways to get engagement are when you're working with a low budget? Okay, so you're saying I don't have a lot of money to spend on my marketing, but I'm trying to get people to notice me. I'm assuming that's the, the really that's the question that you're asking here. So how do I get people to notice me and how do I get engagement without boosting every post? Um 
One would be to share really good quality content. And keep in mind that really good quality content doesn't specifically mean like full blown Mr. Beast level production value on your content. It just means good quality content. So maybe the information is good or it's got good laughs or good smiles or whatever, good entertainment. You're, you're just sharing good quality content that people actually want to consume. Uh, and keep in mind, that's video, that's podcast, that's blog, that's images and graphics that you're creating for your social media, that's posts that you're writing out for Twitter or for LinkedIn. I think just sharing really good quality content, I think is one of the things that you need to be thinking about. I think the other big thing that you need to think about is consistency. Any one of these social media platforms that you look at, regardless, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, every single one of these social media platforms are looking for consistency. And consistency doesn't specifically mean that you're posting every day, but it means that you're creating a consistent schedule. So if you are gonna stick to a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, consistently stick to that Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. If you're gonna post once a week, fine, post once a week, but make sure it's the same time every week. I have a new episode of my podcast that drops every Thursday. I have uh, Free Advice Friday that comes up almost every Friday. So I'm trying to be really consistent. And there's two things why, two reasons why that's important. Obviously, first and foremost, I, I said, the algorithms are looking for that. They want to see consistency. The other thing is it helps your audience to get a sense of when you're posting, right? You guys know Friday afternoons, one o'clock, chances are I'm gonna be here live on YouTube. You know that every Thursday morning when you wake up, there's gonna be a new podcast waiting for you to download and listen to. And so it starts to build that, that habit of looking for the content so that you can consume the content. So create quality content, create consistent content, and engage with everybody else's content. I think that's another big part of this as well. It's not just to go on social media and share, 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 share. If you are focusing on LinkedIn, then a big part of your content strategy on LinkedIn should not only be posting your own content, but engaging with the content that everybody else is sharing. If you want them to engage with your content, doesn't it stand to reason that they probably want you to engage with their content, of course. And so make sure that you're spending time every day engaging with content from your network as well. And as you do that, as you comment on other people's stuff, chances are at least a percentage of them are gonna come back and look for your content and comment on your content as well. Peter says, do you have any tips for planning and organizing a specific marketing campaign? Who's the audience? What's the objective? What's the call to action? I think those are the things that you have to figure out. Who's the audience? Who do I wanna target this campaign to? Where does that audience hang out? How do I best reach that audience? So for example, let's say you're gonna do a LinkedIn advertising campaign and you're gonna target that LinkedIn advertising campaign towards e-learning, right? Because you should never just do a voiceover campaign. You always have to have a very specific and targeted audience, I think, in order for a campaign to be successful. So now we've identified the audience. The audience is e-learning, and I'm gonna target instructional designers and e-learning developers, and I'm gonna build a campaign out for instructional designers and e-learning developers to target them with my e-learning content. What is my, uh, what is my objective? My objective here is to get prospects and leads into my database. And so I'm going to create a post and an ad that is going to encourage people to uh, reach out to me for a custom quote or reach out to me for a custom audition or outline the voiceover services that I have to offer specifically to instructional designers and e-learning developers. And then what is the call to action? The call to action is go to my website and listen to my demos. The call to action is uh, send me your project for a custom audition or, or a custom quote. I think if you're gonna try to plan any kind of marketing campaign, those are the types of things that you need to be uh, thinking about specifically. All right, let's see, the voice of Ryan. When sourcing potential contacts, there seems to be a gazillion job titles for the same position these days. Yes, there is, Ryan, yes, there is. Is there an efficient way to cultivate lists that pull these together? I haven't figured it out yet. Um, this is one of the things that I've noticed. I've noticed this particularly in e-learning. They're, they're all instructional designers at the end of the day, but every one of them wants to have a unique job title. And so it, it 
makes it really tough. It makes it, it really confusing sometimes to try to figure it out. The best thing that I can suggest, stick to the obvious titles. Is the word producer in their job title somewhere or creative director or director or project manager or something like that, right? There's always going to be a certain level of tried and true. So look for those things. But then if you have to go on to LinkedIn and just very quickly, as you're looking through the list of job titles, so you, you pull up a company on LinkedIn, uh, go to a company page on LinkedIn. And on that company page, you can see that there are 25 employees. When you click on the 25 employees, it's a link. When you click on the 25 employees, it will load the list of the 25 people that work at that company. As you're looking through that list, process of elimination is gonna be your friend here because you're very quickly and very easily gonna be able to eliminate certain people just based on their job title. And it's, it's obvious that these are not the people that I wanna contact. From there, then you can narrow it down to, okay, these are the, the five people that I think might be the right ones. Once you've got five people that might be the right ones, you can very quickly check out the LinkedIn profiles for each one of those individuals and then take your best guess. And then the other thing that you have is when you've taken your best guess and you've written that email, don't be afraid to put a PS at the bottom of that email that says, you know, PS, if you are not the person who is responsible for sourcing voice actors, uh, would you be willing to connect me to the one who is? And you've got nothing to lose by giving that a shot and, and asking that question. All right, where are we going next? Thank you guys, so many questions. I'm gonna try to get to as many of these as I possibly can. Steve says, what are the three highest ROI use cases data for CRM within non-job management, marketing, sales, business strategy, tracking lead communication, history, important? So uh, let me try to dissect this question. The, the, the highest use cases. Um, number one for a CRM, first and foremost, is I can't remember everybody that's in my database. No matter how hard I try, I can't remember everybody that's in my database. I cannot remember every single client that I've ever worked with. And so I use a CRM to hold me accountable to maintaining communication with my database on a regular basis. If I don't have my CRM prompting me that it's time to get in touch with a certain person again, I will forget about that person. I can't help it. I got hundreds of people that I've worked with over the years. There's no way I can remember them. Uh, so number one use case that produces ROI for me is the ability to keep my database organized and a reminder cycle that holds me accountable to maintaining regular communication with that database. Number two use case for me for a CRM that produces ROI is the ability to do targeted marketing through segmentation. What does that mean? When people go into my CRM, I will put them in with tags. And those tags are what I use to help me sort and organize my database. And so I could go into my CRM right now and I could do a search for every prospect that is in my database who I have tagged with explainer video who I have not contacted in the last, in, in more than 30 days. I can do that search and it will bring up a list of all of my explainer video prospects that I haven't contacted in more than 30 days and I could send them a message right now and bring myself top of mind with that entire audience in a very easy segmented way. So I think the, the advanced segmentation uh, and, and the ability to sort your database, which allows you to be so much more targeted with your marketing efforts. I think that's another big advantage of the CRM. And then I would say the other thing that I love about the CRM is the ability to have a client history all in one place. So I can look back and see, okay, um, this is the last project that I did for them. This was the rate on that project. Uh, these were our last five interactions or email communications. And what did we talk about? And, and so being able to pull up all of that history in one place saves me a lot of time, ultimately, because I don't have to go back and look for all of that information individually by surfing through my email inbox. So Steve, I, I don't know if that specifically answers your question, but hopefully uh, that answers uh, a question, that answers the question for you. Anne says, will you or have you done a free advice Friday on podcasting? Uh, I have never done a free advice Friday on podcasting. I am always willing to answer questions about podcasting, of course, if you've got questions that you would like to ask. Uh, I did do a podcast 
uh, a couple of weeks ago, the tools I use for podcasting and live streaming. Uh, if you want to go back and check that episode out, if you're just looking specifically for, for that side of information, uh, I, I walk through all of the different things that I'm using to do my podcast every week and to do Free Advice Friday every week. But hey, if you've got a, a specific podcast question that you would like to ask, uh, by all means, uh, don't hesitate to, to type that question. I am certainly happy to, uh, to answer that for you. Brian says, when you send targeted emails to groups within your CRM, do they have the option to unsubscribe? Yes, uh, most CRMs, as far as I know, when you are sending group messages... Um, do give you the ability to put in an unsubscribe link and Nimble, I can speak to specifically because I use it. Uh, when I send group messages in Nimble, I am able to put an unsubscribe link in. And if people do request to be unsubscribed, it does notify, I, I can see that they've requested to be unsubscribed. And so at that point, I will just mark them as a dead lead in my database. I do not delete them from my database. I just mark them as a dead lead in my database. All right, let's see, where are we going? Steve says, if one were to be on aggressive end of outsourcing spectrum, what do you think is the best position to hire? Lead generator, general assistant, editor? Uh, Steve, I think that ultimately depends on what you need the most help with. I think lead generation is an easy one to outsource. Uh, I think there are a lot of people that are out there that do it, and the people that do it have access to a lot of the tools that make lead generation easier. Uh, so I figure if they're paying for all of the subscriptions, then I don't have to pay for the subscriptions, which is really nice. Uh, so that was an easy one for me. That was one of the first things that I outsourced. Um, if you're doing audiobooks and and that is all you do is is you narrate audiobooks all day long, uh, maybe you want to outsource the proofing side, or maybe you do want to outsource the editing side because that can be very time consuming when you're working on long form. And so I think. Part of it is a is a case by case basis, depending on what you need the most help with. Um, I know voice actors who outsource lead generation. I know some who outsource the marketing side and the CRM side. I know some who outsource social media, uh, and they they work with a social media manager to help them to create content, schedule content, make sure the content is always is always rolling. Uh, so I think there's a lot of different things that you can outsource depending specifically on what you would need the most help with. Hey, Mark, for group messages, you only use Nimble or other platforms as well. Uh, so specifically from a, a voiceover standpoint, I am using Nimble. Um, I did at one point use MailChimp. Uh, I, I had all of my clients in a list on MailChimp, but ultimately it just became easier to do it in Nimble. Uh, so I, I stick to Nimble for that. Now on the coaching side, my list is a lot bigger. I've got thousands of voice actors that I'm reaching out to on a consistent basis. And so for that, I am using a different email software. Uh, right now, I am using Drip to do that. For podcast hosting, can I easily switch to a different host once I choose one? Just setting up and learning the process now. Uh, I, I mean, switching your hosts isn't going to be super hard as far as I can tell, because there are ways that you can do CSV exports and all of that sort of stuff. So it will export and import things. Um, I do think where it, you run into a potential problem is on the SEO side. So my podcast has been around for 200 plus episodes now, and I had been looking at switching uh, hosts. The problem is as soon as I do that, those links that have been building up for the last three years as I share my podcast all over the interwebs uh, and as my podcast continues to get indexed, uh, those links will all go bad. And so then I'm basically going to have to rebuild my SEO uh, all over again. Uh, so then you have to weigh that against why am I switching podcast hosts in the first place and, and are the advantages to this new podcast host going to make it worth my while? Does it make it, does it, make it better? Does it make it easier? Um, so that would be the one thing that I would I would look into is if you are thinking that you are going to switch, I would just want to try to do it sooner in the process than than later in the process. Grace says, I've been approached by several sponsors for my upcoming podcast. How do I know what to charge for sponsorship? OK, so Grace, I just want to clarify and, and please leave another comment just to make sure. So you host a podcast and somebody wants to sponsor your podcast and you're questioning, what do I charge this, this company for an ad on my podcast? Can I just clarify that? Grace, feel free to 
just acknowledge that in the chat and, and I'm keeping an eye out for that. Um, if that's the question that you're asking. Podcast advertising is really tricky because the universal method for podcast advertising and calculating rates for podcast advertising is it's uh, based on a per thousand downloads basically is what it works out to is per thousand downloads. And those rates can be on average, I would say 10 to $15 per thousand downloads. Uh, so that's great. If you're Tim Ferriss and you're getting millions of downloads on your podcast, uh, it's really, it's really easy to make a lot of money when you're doing that. Um, when you are hosting a smaller podcast with a smaller niche market, uh, then, you know, you might only be getting a hundred or 200 downloads a week. And so if you use the traditional method of podcast advertising and calculating rates for podcast advertising, you can charge like seven bucks for a sponsorship. What none of these models build in, or I have yet to find anyway, is the value of a targeted niche audience. So I average about a thousand downloads per episode on my podcast, give or take, but that's a thousand dedicated voice actors. It's a very specific niche. And so there's a value that comes with that because even though it's not an audience of a million, it's a very targeted audience. And so there is a value that comes with that. And so when you are trying to put together pricing, I think that's one of the things that you need to look to. And I can tell you from my own experience, I have yet to find a guide that outlines that. And so I've kind of been going with best guess and gut, uh, which you know may or may not ultimately pay off. But I'm trying to figure out what is the value of a message targeted to a thousand people who are loyal listeners in a very dedicated and specific niche. And there should be value on that. And so if you've got a thousand people who are in a very specific niche, I, why shouldn't you be able to charge a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks for a, for a sponsorship? Um, I think a lot of it is gonna come through experimentation and hoping that when you get that first sponsor um, that you can provide social proof to them that, that you've got that audience and that they will ultimately see an ROI that says, yep, it was worth it. Uh, I think that's the hardest part. You need to get the first sponsor who said it was worth it to convince the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth sponsors to, to ultimately sign on. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, Grace. I would love to be able to say, go to this website. It outlines everything. I just haven't found that website yet. I haven't found that website that helps people who are in those, those specific niche markets. Uh, speaking of the podcast, great episode this week. I had a brilliant interview with Christopher Tester. Chris has joined me on Free Advice Friday in the past. Uh, how to master content creation. Chris is a guy who is, is doing viral content on two different platforms and two different types of content on two different platforms. He's doing amazing things on LinkedIn and he is doing amazing things on TikTok as well. Uh, so if you are looking for help on creating content for social media, uh, this is an episode that you are definitely going to want to listen to because I, I ask a lot of questions that really get into the weeds of the, the process and how he's coming up with his ideas and, and some of the behind the scenes stuff of how he's keeping things organized. So uh, I would encourage you to check out that episode now at vopreneur.com or wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. I think that's going to be a very, very, very helpful episode for anybody who is doing the uh, content creation game. Steve says, what's the best way to develop fruitful relationships via Chamber of Commerce, local business networks, local government, and US federal government contracting? Okay, there's a couple of different things in there, so let's break this down. Uh, government contracts are their own animal. Um, Anganguza and Joya Lord, uh, not, if you're not familiar with them, look them up. Anganguza and Joya Lord, they actually teach a class on how to get government contracts. There's a whole entire process that you have to go through in order to be eligible for government contracts at the federal level. Uh, and so Anne and Joya have figured that out and built a course around that. So you should, you should definitely check that out if that's a space that you're interested in. Um, developing relationships with the Chamber of Commerce, that one's a lot easier. Most chambers, depending on where you live, 
are providing networking opportunities. And so it's just taking advantage of those networking opportunities. It's getting out there, going to some of those meetups, uh, having an opportunity to talk to people, but walking in with the genuine desire to establish relationships and not just a genuine desire to sell voiceover. Uh, going in and giving these people a chance to tell you about themselves and about their business. And then when you you have a better sense of them and their business, you're like, hey, you know what? By the way, this is what I do. And this is a way that I might be able to help you with what you do. And so I really do think that that a big part of it is just taking advantage of the the networking opportunities that, that are presented uh, within that local chamber of commerce. For depending on your chamber, some of the networking events will be members only, but often chambers will run networking events that are open to anyone because they're trying to attract in new members and trying to show the value that they can bring to new members. And so be looking out for those events and, and those opportunities. Um, it's just getting out there and meeting people, really. It's doing the same thing that we're doing when we're using social media to try to establish relationships or we're using email to try and establish relationships or we're making cold calls to try and establish relationships. It's, it's being a human and having a conversation. So many good questions today, guys. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that. Uh, as a reminder, Playbook 3.0 is coming out. I am so excited about this course, but I am so stressed about this course. Uh, I, I had time off for March break. Obviously, I was away at VO Atlanta, and I am having a hard time getting everything done. I am redoing this course from top to bottom. Every video is being completely redone and I'm actually moving it to an entirely new platform as well, which I think is gonna make it better and, and make it easier. Um, at this point, I'm only about halfway through. Uh, this weekend, I am probably gonna be working 16 or 18 hour days, uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, trying to get videos done. But Playbook 3.0 is coming April 11th through the 20th at voiceovermarketingplaybook.com and it's gonna be a brand new course and it is gonna teach you everything that you need to know about marketing. It is gonna give you strategies and tactics that are going to help you to become a more confident and effective marketer. So write it on your calendar, April 11th through the 20th at voiceovermarketingplaybook.com. All right, guys. I hope I didn't miss any of your questions. If I did, feel free to pop it into the chat again. Um, I can quickly scroll back through. I was trying to keep up as best as I could. I apologize if I missed anything. Just know that I wasn't trying to miss anything on purpose. Uh, it's just that there was a lot of stuff going on in the chat. So I was trying to keep up with it all. Um, Oh, here's a big popular question. Do previous playbook people get access to the new one? Yes, yes. If you have previously purchased voiceover marketing playbook, you will get access to playbook 3.0. Because I am moving it to an entirely new platform, I will do my best to get you access to it as soon as it is ready but there's a lot of work that has to go on behind the scenes to get everybody moved over because I'm literally shifting it to an entirely different site, to an entirely different host. Uh, all of my coaching stuff is moving to a different platform, which is gonna make it easier in the long run, uh, but definitely going to be a nightmare to get set up in the beginning. But yes, if you have previously purchased Playbook, uh, you will get access to the fully updated course. All right, let's see. Derek says, seems like maybe one could estimate the value proposition of my niche is going to be in steps to your prospect qualifying process, but it will take design combos with actual marketing buyers. Okay, Derek, not sure that I fully understand what you're what you're asking here. Uh, if you want to clarify that question, I think every voice actor has a, a value proposition that they can bring, particularly in uh, different niches. And I think that for a lot of voice actors, some of us have got more than one value proposition because you might have a value proposition that is specific to e-learning. You might have a value proposition for commercial. You might have a value proposition for explainer. Uh, and so figuring all of that out uh, can help you with uh, definitely creating more targeted marketing messages. Have you had Danny States on from Voice Overview in the past? Yes, actually, Danny States was on the podcast last week. 
Uh, and we talked all about voice overviews. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to that episode yet, uh, you can go, of course, to vopreneur.com or wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. And you can search up that episode with Danny States. It was, uh, here you go. It was episode number 203. It was called How to Manage Your Business Using Voice Overview. Episode 203, How to Manage Your Business Using Voice Overview with Danny States. She was, she was great. Uh, voice Overview is really cool software. It's not what a lot of people think it is, or it's not what people think it might be. Uh, and so hearing from the CEO what it is and what it isn't and how to best incorporate it into your business uh, is really, really helpful. So that was, a, that was a great interview with Danny States, and I was grateful for the time that she gave to uh, to answer some of those questions and also outline a little bit about some of the things that she's working on that may be coming to voice overview in the future as well. Just a reminder, this is the first guest that I have confirmed for Free Advice Friday in April. I am working on lining up guests for some of the other weeks as well, but Cliff is coming back. Some of you may remember Cliff was supposed to be on Free Advice Friday uh, a couple of months ago, ran into a medical issue, wasn't able to come on the show, and then life just got crazy. I was sick for a, a bunch of weeks as well, and so we weren't able to get it rescheduled, but we, we had a conversation at VO Atlanta. He can't wait to come on. Very excited to talk about automotive. Obviously, that is, is his thing, the king of automotive, no question. Uh, so that episode is uh, Free Advice Friday. That live stream is going to happen on April 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern. So mark that one on your calendar because that is going to be a good episode for any of you that may be interested in uh, looking at working in the automotive space. All right, guys, this has been so good. Thank you so much again for all of your questions. I certainly appreciate everything that you brought to the table, the questions that you have asked. I, I do apologize again if I missed any of your questions. I'm, I'm scrolling through here looking to see. I hope I didn't miss anything. If I did, again, feel free to uh, feel free to type it back in again. Don't mind me while I just reach out. Oh, here was one. Uh, how often do you reach back out to leads three times, 20 times or more before you get a yes or no from potential leads? So this is a really good question, actually, and a really important question. Once somebody has given me a positive response, hey, Mark, we love your stuff. Hey, Mark, we'd love to work with you. Hey, Mark, we'd like to add you to our roster. Whatever that positive response is, at that point, I switch them in my database from a lead to a prospect. Once they are a prospect, I am just going to keep reaching out to them until either A, they hire me, or B, they tell me to stop reaching out. Uh, and even if they hire me, I'm going to continue to reach out to them. Uh, I share an example in playbook, actually. Nine years. Nine years from the first initial conversation where the lead became a prospect, nine years until the first booking. And most of you are like, that's just ridiculous. That's just stupid. That's a waste of time. Why in the world would you be contacting somebody for nine years? Why, why, you know, there's so many other fish in the sea, whatever. I've, I've heard it all. There's an argument to be made for that. But after they hired me for the first job, which took nine years to get to, They've hired me for thousands of dollars worth of more work since. I don't know about you, but sending a bunch of emails that really don't cost me anything over the span of nine years, ultimately leading to thousands of dollars in voiceover, that's a pretty good return on investment for me. Uh, so I will continue to keep making those types of reach outs. I will continue to uh, keep trying to establish those relationships and I will keep reaching out to potential clients again until such a time as A, they tell me to stop or B, they hire me. And if they hire me, then I'm still going to keep reaching out because now I want to continue to keep myself top of mind. 
And so uh, that is my strategy. And again, that's where a CRM is going to come into play because a CRM is going to help you to keep all of that straight. A CRM is going to help you to make sure that you don't forget about those people. Uh, a CRM is going to help you to continue to, to maintain contact. A CRM is going to remind you when it's time to get in touch with somebody again. A CRM is going to remind you how many conversations you've had. A CRM is going to remind you all of the things that you have talked about. And all of those things will ultimately help you in building out that relationship. But uh, nine years obviously is the extreme. And I just want to clarify that they don't all take that long. Obviously, there are times when I reach out to people and, you know, they they hire me in a week, they hire me in a month. Um, lots of examples of people that I've been going back and forth with, and it's taken a year or two to get to the first job, maybe three years to get to the first job. Uh, the most important thing to remember in the midst of all of that is when you are consistently sending people emails and they're not responding or they're not hiring you, our default instinctive response is, I'm annoying this person. My whole thing is, if you were annoying that person, what would they do? They would tell you to stop messaging them. If they are not telling you to stop messaging them, that means that they are willing to continue to receive your emails, which means that they are still interested in some level on working with you. Maybe they're just not willing to work with you yet. And so a big part of your follow-up strategy is changing what is going on here. It's changing that narrative from if I keep emailing them, even when they're not writing me back, I'm going to annoy them to I'm going to keep emailing them because they keep receiving my emails. So it's not a no, it's just a not yet. And that is such a big part of the follow-up strategy because otherwise we give up, we get frustrated, we quit too easily. And so that's what I would say from a follow-up standpoint is just keep following up until they tell you to stop following up. That is my that is my best advice on that one. Quickly want to remind you about the video guide that I offer for uh, TikTok and Instagram. Video is huge. It's it's too hard to ignore at this point. But for a lot of voice actors, the argument is I'm not that interesting. I don't want to be on camera. I don't know what kind of videos to post. I don't know what to post about. And so I created a free resource that is designed to give you some inspiration for coming up with topics and ideas. Uh, that is available for download. It is a free download uh, that is available at markscottcoaching.com forward slash 20 video ideas. Uh, markscottcoaching.com forward slash 20 video ideas. So check that one out uh, and, and download that free resource and start making amazing content for TikTok and Instagram because everybody should be on TikTok and Instagram. Derek says, what program are you using for the visual website tags and splash screens? I'm assuming you're talking for this live stream right now. Uh, I use Ecamm Live for uh, creating my live stream. And uh, I used Canva to build out some of the different aspects, the graphics that you're seeing, you know, this free advice Friday thing, this, you know, when my name key pops up on the screen, uh, all of that sort of stuff is, is getting uh, created in Canva. Uh, and then I use Ecamm Live to put all of that together. And uh, I use a, a stream deck to help me with changing some of the scenes and stuff like that and, and programming out the show. Uh, and I outlined some of that stuff as well in that episode of the podcast that I did. Uh, what episode was that? Let me take a look. Uh, it's called The Tools I Use for Podcasting and Live Streaming. Uh, that was episode 202, uh, which is available at vopreneur.com or wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me on Free Advice Friday. Again, a reminder, Playbook 3.0 is coming. Uh, that is what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the day now. I'm going to grab some lunch, and then I'm going to start working on more Playbook videos, and that's what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, and that's what I'm going to be doing on Sunday and probably every night for the rest of the next week as well. Uh, getting this course ready, I can't wait to get this out to you, Playbook 3.0. It is coming April 11th through the 20th at voiceovermarketingplaybook.com. Here's what I can tell you. There is going to be a very significant lead bonus that will be offered for anybody who signs up on the first day. 
When I say a significant lead bonus, I'm talking anybody that signs up on the first day will have access to probably a couple hundred voiceover leads that my freelancer is in the process of putting together right now. Uh, these will be leads in commercial corporate explaining, uh, explainer and e-learning. Uh, I think there might actually be some animation leads in there too. I can't remember exactly. But anyway, the point is the list is being built. It will be a brand new list. And if you want to get access to that list, you are going to want to sign up for Playbook on day one. And I will be offering that as a free bonus. Uh, so again, April 11th through the 20th at Voiceover Marketing playbook.com. Thank you guys so much for joining me for free advice Friday. Um, next Friday is Easter. Uh, next Friday is good Friday. I'm not a hundred percent sure yet whether or not I'm going to be able to do free advice Friday, but if I can, I will post it as soon as I can to let you know uh, that I will be here, but uh, it's been great to be back with you. It was great to see some of you at VO Atlanta as well. Uh, and hopefully I'll get the opportunity to meet even more of you at One Voice in Dallas. Put that one on your list if you're thinking about uh, jumping into another conference this year, One Voice in Dallas coming up in August. And the details will be announced on that one very, very soon. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you. I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate your questions. I am grateful to you for it. Uh, whatever you decide to do this weekend, have fun, stay safe. And as always, go find some leads.